Take it away, James. All right. Can you see full screen? You can see my whole setup here. Looks great. Sounds okay. good. Hey, everybody. Um, I am actually broadcasting from um, the teaching lab here at Oregon State University, actually where I do my lecturing. Uh, it's been kind of exciting, believe it or not. I really kind of enjoyed the Zoom environment in some regards because I'm able to do my lectures in a lab setting where I can have this robot camera and I can run around and look at stuff. And it's been really cool. First of all, thanks a lot. I'm um, sorry I didn't make it last week. And that we had some technical difficulties. It was partly um, a technical difficulty looking at uh, a clock. But anyway, um, so I'm happy to be back. And wow, what an incredibly beautiful day today. I was farming today. Um, so I was able to get out in the soil. I have students. I run the student farm at Oregon State University. I've been teaching about uh, maybe 15 or 16 years introductory soil science courses um, with mostly undergraduates. And then I've been running the student farm for over 21 years, the OSU Organic Growers Club, which was a student farm that was founded by three undergraduate students who were complaining, which is always a source of most uh, creation is complaining that they weren't getting enough organic education, organic uh, information in their educations here. And so we just started our own damn farm. And we've been doing that for 21 years. I should say I've been doing it, they're long gone. But I have over 300 students on the listserv. Um, we have 110 internships paid for through the sale of Plant, uh, plants, veggies, and fruit over the last 21 years. And uh, we're just starting our 21st season and it's just amazing. The project has grown. We now have um, certified organic cherries. Um, we have certified organic cane berries and we have two different sites where we grow all the vegetables and stuff like that. We sell all our vegetables through a CSA um, uh, program, which we have about 10 or 15 uh, slots left for 2021. So if you're interested in that, get in touch with me. It's an excellent value. And you're supporting student farming at OSU and the WITS. It's an incredible program. Totally trans, just transform my life. Um, but anyway, enough about that. Um, I'm here to talk about soil because it's all about soil. And I'm going to change cameras here and I'll be looking at some other stuff in just a moment here. So I'm going to go to the integrated camera. So nice to see you all. Um, it is all about soil. And, and, I, and I don't just mean um, plants and food. I mean, everything. It's all about soil. Everything you've ever seen, anything you've ever, anybody you've ever met, anything you've ever touched, any, your, your entire experience really is it all came from the soil. I mean, every atom in your body was once inside of a rock, but after that, it dissolved out of a rock and every atom in your body has been through the soil system billions of times already. The fact that you are not soil at this moment is a temporary condition. I mean, really, it's true. I mean, and I would argue you already are soil, but we'll get to that. I mean, most of the time your soil, have a look around, and before you are, hey, this is before you can say it's pretty cool, it's your back, the back to normal. And it won't be long now and it's almost over. I'm not talking about this talk. I'm talking about your, your, your experience in this life. And yet here we are, here we are in this moment, in this fascinating moment, really. I mean, look at us, we're on Zoom, whatever this is, it's just like this information revolution that we're in that's allowing us to actually be together in this moment in the history of the cosmos. And here we are together to like actually talk about this most important thing, this, this resource called soil. And most people, you know, most people never think about any of this. They just, they, ironically, they go to their graves having never once considered the reality that is soil. And we, we are soil organisms. We are, we're made for the same thing. I mean, I happen to have some soil right here. Here's a chunk of soil, right? And I don't know if you know this, but in a single pinch of soil, like a little pinch like that, there are over 1 billion living organisms in there. 
right now. I, I, I challenge you to kind of even get your head around that in this moment, that in a single pinch of soil, there are over 1 billion living organisms. And 99.99% of which we don't even really know who they are or what they're doing. And you might be thinking, how's that possible? And the reason is we know about 0.01% of these pretty well, because only about 0.1% of these will actually plate up on an RR plate and can live independently of each other. These, these, and it's not just a billion of one kind of things. There's tens of thousands of different species in here right now. I mean, think about that. Tens of thousands of different species. And obviously they're mostly small. They're mostly bacteria and fungi. And, but really that's what life on this planet really is. I mean, by any measure, Soil is the most diverse habitat on the planet. If you get nothing else out of this talk tonight, if you can just remember this, that soil is habitat. And, you know, most people just never think about that because it just kind of looks like, eh, whatever, you know, it's just brown stuff. The problem is, is you're too big to understand this. We're these giant macroorganisms. And we're, I mean, I don't know if you know this, but 80% of your body, 80% of your body by dry weight isn't even made from human DNA. I mean, we don't live very long. What, what 70 years in a, in a, in a billion, the 4 billion year old earth, right? So we're not, we're just so young. We're so, we, we live such a short time and we're, and, and, and it's almost over, right? And we're mostly made out of minerals that, and, and the assembly of our bodies are mostly from non-human DNA. I mean, we're not even humans. We're just a collection of organisms. I don't know if you know these things or if you want to know these things, maybe not. But inside of your hair follicles on your arm, just look at it right now. Just take a second, just look at that. At the base of your hair follicles, there's little organisms, there's like, these little worm-like creatures that live down in your hair follicles and eat the dead skin cells off of, your, off of your skin at night. Sorry, you're never alone. Don't worry. In your, in your eyelashes, at the base of your eyelashes, there are like little nematodes that live there. There's amoeba that live down in your gums that come up at night and eat the protein deposits off of your teeth. I mean, you're not a human. You're just a collection of organisms. Right? And this is really, we're, what, what this is made out of is the same thing that we're made out of. I mean, what, I mean, basically, I don't know if you know this, here's a rock, right? And this is a piece of granite, right? You can see the individual different crystals in here. Those are different colored minerals that are in there. And minerals are just a crystalline collection of different elements in from the Earth's crust. And there's like 118 different elements, right, in the periodic table. And that's what everything is made out of. All this stuff, including yourself, is made, including this rock, are made out of the elements from the periodic table. And I don't know if you know this, but these, the, what this is, is cooled magma, which is, you, if you get this hot enough, it melts, right? And so this stuff is floating on top of liquid, on, on top of liquid rock. And like, uh, that's what our continents are. They're like ice cubes floating on top of the water is rocks floating on top of the mantle of the planet. And when this stuff gets close to the surface of the planet and the absolute zero of space, it cools and it crystallizes. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But so these rocks, that's what it's all, that's where it all came from, is, is the elements in these rocks. These rocks, they dissolve in water. Now, most people never think about this. And why would they? I mean, you build pyramids out of rock because you think it's going to last forever. Nothing lasts forever. And rocks are actually very unstable at the surface of the earth because they're most stable under the earth high pressures, high temperatures, and you bring them up to the surface of the earth, 
super low temperature. They're kind of like waiting to blow apart and it's very cool and it's wet on the surface. We have liquid water on this planet and that's pretty unique, you know? And water dissolves rocks. And if you don't believe me, all you gotta do is take a little bit of salt, right? I have some kosher salt right here and do this. I mean, you do it all the time, but salt, table salt, is one of the only minerals that we actually just eat. And we need it to maintain a certain um, um, balance of salt in us because we have the ocean is inside of us actually, right? And so if I pour a little bit of the salt on my hand, right? That's a mineral, right? That's a lot of it. There's a mineral on my hand. And if I just do this, that's a mineral that just dissolved, it's gone. Salt dissolves in water very rapidly. It's a mineral that dissolves in water very rapidly. And so the first thing that dissolves out of a rock are the salts. So watch, I'm gonna, watch this now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna dissolve this rock right in front of you. You ready for this? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a little water on there. Okay, now what, pay attention. You see that? See that? Did you see that? Did you see that? It's dissolving. It is dissolving. A tiny amount of that rock is dissolving right now. And if I did this for 10 years, for a thousand years, for a hundred thousand years, it would completely dissolve away. Just dissolve away. And the first thing to dissolve out of the, out of the rock are the salts. And then the next thing to dissolve out are like the molybdenum or the iron or the um, cobalt or the cadmium or the copper or, you know, the, the phosphorus or the potassium, right? And that's what we're made out of. That's what plants are made out of. And the last thing to dissolve out of a rock is the quartz. Because quartz is the least, is, or rather the most, you have to have some right here, is the most resistant to dissolution in water. See, look at, I can just put water in it, it doesn't even dissolve, right? You see that? So the salt, so what, what's, it's somewhere, what soil is, is this dissolution of minerals partially. And as this dissolves, the salts go out first, right? And then the salt flows down and goes into the soil, a little tiny amount of salt, and then that driplet, Every time it rains, it goes a little deeper and it goes a little deeper and pretty soon it gets to the water table and there's a tiny amount of salt in the water table. And then that water table is connected to the stream, right? Cause it's draining the landscape and that stream drains into the little river and the little river drains into the big river and the big river drains into the giant river and the giant river drains into the ocean. And that's why the oceans are salty. That's why the oceans are salty because it dissolved out of the rocks over the last four and a half billion years. And it ends up in this, into the ocean. And the next thing that dissolves out of here is the potassium or the phosphorus or whatever else. And eventually that too ends up in the groundwater, which ends up in the creek, which ends up in the river, which ends up in the river, ends up in the river, ends up in the, river, up in the ocean. And that's where the nutrients come into the ocean. And that's why there's sharks. The reason there are sharks is because the nutrients dissolved off of the land eventually end up in the ocean. And then the phytoplankton use those nutrients to build their machinery, to use energy from the sun to grow. And then a zooplankton eats them. And then a bigger zooplankton eats that. And then a shrimp eats that, and then a fish eats that, and pretty soon it's a shark. And that's where it all comes from, is from the dissolved rocks, okay? And that's how, what's what we're made out of, right? That's the same thing that we're made out of. And what soil is, is somewhere between all the nutrients being locked up in this rock and pretty much unavailable. I can't eat a rock, right? can't do that. Somewhere all these minerals are locked up in this rock and somewhere way out there in the ocean is total dissolution of all the minerals and nutrients. 
And what soil is, is somewhere between those two things, is this moment where it's kind of broken up into particles of sand, silt, and clay. It has porosity, and the nutrients are being stored there temporarily on the clay crystals and in the organic matter. And from there, that's what plants are taking up. So here, look, I happen to have some, a tiny little bit of soil with some plants in it. Look at that cute little thing. And that is the jolliest thing you've ever seen, isn't it? Look at that. You know what that is. Just a beautiful little thing. And, and what a plant is doing is it has roots under here. See these little structures, little hanging roots, right? And what those roots are doing is they're growing down into the soil. And then as the nutrients become solubilized one way or the other, they get sucked up into the plant from its roots. And then those nutrients, nutrients formerly known as nutrients, but they're just dissolved rocks, are taken up and then they build structures out of them like chloroplasts and hemoglobin and stuff like that, allowing this thing to, to grow. And so you know, that's kind of like half the story. Half the story is, is that the minerals dissolve out of the rocks, the, rock, the, the soil, this, 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 this medium that is actually half space. I mean, here's a big chunk of soil, right? Half of this is space. And that space either has water or air in it. And those spaces are created by the roots growing in it. And they push it open and they grow and then they die and they decompose and they leave behind pores. And large pores drain under the force of gravity and small pores, like in a sponge, right? See the large pores are empty, but there's water in here. I can squeeze some out in the small pores. So a soil has large pores, medium pores, and small pores. And you really want to cultivate a wide pore size distribution because the bugs that live in the soil need water and air. And that's why you want a, a soil that can store water, but that it also drains and brings in air. I mean, think about it. When, when a raindrop goes down into a worm channel, dripping down, sucking down, pulling down by gravity, because a large pore, look at a small pore holds water against the force of gravity, and a large pore drains under the force of gravity. And when that drains, think about that droplet of water being pulled down in there. What's being sucked in behind it? Pulled in is the atmosphere, oxygen. And so when it's raining and the soil is draining, the soil is breathing. And it's bringing oxygen in, which these bugs need to live just like you do. And they use oxygen as their final electron acceptor from the electrons that come from the decomposed organic matter to create ATP and all that jazz that you may remember <laughs> or not, but don't worry about it. The, so the half of it is that rocks dissolve in water and they release nutrients and that's what the building blocks for all this life and stuff is. But the other half is what is organic matter made out of. And you might be thinking, um, uh, minerals or something? Actually, not so much. Things like, uh, here, here's some organic matter, right? Here's a dead fern. Here's one I just sacrificed for this talk, right? Look at the spores on the back of that thing, right? So what this is made of, this is a, these are plants. And plants are sort of this amazing thing. What they are is they have somehow over all these millions and billions of years, right, um, have figured out a way to capture the energy from the sun. And I'll more on that in just a moment, but what a, what a plant is, is mostly carbon. We are carbon-based life forms, right? You know that. We are carbon-based life forms and so are they. And where does the carbon come from that makes a plant? And most of you probably know this because you're sort of interested in the environment and that sort of thing. Does anybody know where the carbon comes from in a plant? Matt? 
<laughs> okay. Sun. No, the energy comes from the sun. A plus for, for, for answering. C minus for the answer. But, so, but there'll be extra credit, don't worry. So always a lot of extra credit in my classes, okay? Where the, where the plant gets carbon is from the atmosphere, from carbon dioxide, right? And so, as you probably know now, you say, oh yeah, duh, I know that. Plants, people think they breathe carbon dioxide and they exhale oxygen. They don't. They eat carbon dioxide. They eat the atmosphere. And you know that's a little different than breathing, okay? So what they're doing, these plants have figured out a way to take carbon dioxide, which is carbon dioxide, right? Carbon with two oxygens, right? And they have figured out a way to take it apart and put it together into a fern. And in a kind of a weird way of thinking, a fern or anything, a tree, is like compressed or consolidated carbon from the atmosphere. So there's a, actually quite a bit of carbon in here. I mean, if you turn this into a gas, it could probably fill a room, right? But it's consolidated, compressed into carbon to carbon bonds. And in order for, in order for a plant to take carbon apart and put it together into, into tissues like this requires energy, right? I mean, you, it, you gotta be able to take something apart and then put it together. I mean, that's going to take some energy to do that, right? It doesn't just happen. And where does the energy come from that? The sun. Correct. A plus. See, now you're back. Back at all of this. We're starting over now. It comes from the sun. And plants have figured that out. I mean, think about it. 93 million miles away, there's a ball of fire out there that is you know, a, a nuclear reactor, a star that is giving UV radiation to this planet. Like today, hopefully you out there and you felt it. I mean, just stand out there and feel the sun. It's 93 million miles away. And you can feel the actual heat heating up the, the, the water in your flesh. And those photons are coming from 93 million miles away in the form of UV radiation. And when that hits a certain uh, structure inside of the chloroplast, blah, blah, blah. It, uh, it, it, knocks a, an or, uh, it knocks an electron into a higher orbital. And when it drops back down, it, it releases that energy in a way that can be used to create a molecule called ATP, which is a molecule that has energy in it, right? And then that energy in that molecule can be used to take carbon apart and put it together into a fern whenever it wants to. It can build all of those structures with that universal energy molecule called ATP, but don't worry about it. Inside of these carbon to carbon bonds, inside of this right now, is the energy of the sun captured in the carbon to carbon bonds at the moment of photosynthesis. And so inside of this is energy, and you know that. And you know, maybe you never really thought about it, but you kind of know it because if you've ever gotten a piece of wood to 451 degrees, you overcome the activation energy necessary for the oxidation reaction called burning to happen, right? And I happen to have somewhere here, a match, check it out. These are from Brazil. This is wood from Brazil, okay? This match was a tree once. And if I can get it to 451 degrees, It'll burn. That's the energy of the sun in there right now. That's it. That's the energy of the sun. And look, it's burning. Yikes, it's going to burn me any second. And you notice it's going away. Where is it going away to? It's going back to the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. So when wood burns, it releases the carbon dioxide and the heat from the energy from the sun of the carbon to carbon bonds during the time of photosynthesis. And uh, here I happen to have an old test right here. I won't give it to you, don't worry. And it, you know, this is a, take page one. This was a tree 
once, right? This is made out of wood. And so if I get that to 451 degrees, I'm gonna start, maybe I'll trigger the fire alarms in this building. I'm doing it for you though. So it's for science. So watch, overcome the activation energy necessary for the oxidation reaction called burning to occur. Right, you see that? This is like the only fun I get. I get to have a trash fire in the building here. But what I want you to notice is, you'll notice that the, that the paper is going away, right? It's, it, look at the heat. I mean, I can, you can almost imagine what that heat feels like. It feels like the sun, like when you're standing out in the sun, the heat. So oxidation reaction, it releases the, the heat, the water vapor, there's some little bit of water vapor and CO2. And look what's left over when it's done. You see that stuff? What is that stuff? What do you think that is? After the fire is out, what remains in the fireplace? Come on, somebody. I know the answer to this, but I'm going to invite anybody else to unmute yourself yeah. and answer the question. Yeah. What's in, what remains in the fireplace after the fire is out? The common Ash. Thank you, A+. plus. Who said that? Okay. Jeff. Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Ash. And what is ash? Ash is the minerals, the minerals that were taken up by the plant in the dissolved form. This is, this is the nutrients that came from the dissolved rocks. So think about it. When you burn a fire, you can put wood in the fireplace all night long. In the end, there's a, you know, maybe a coffee can's worth of ash. Most of the wood is carbon and goes back to CO2, water vapor, and heat. That's what food is. That's why you eat. You eat carbon, you eat plants, or you eat animals that ate plants. And what happens inside of you? Chew it up, <sighs> increase the surface area, you swallow it. And inside of you, there are billions of bugs, actually the same bugs that are in a chunk of soil are inside of your gut. And what they do is they cause an oxidation reaction at a lower temperature. Because what these bugs can do is they can ooze out enzymes that lower the activation energy necessary for the oxidation reaction called burning to happen. And you know what? Think about it. A fire, when you burn wood, it goes to CO2, water vapor, and heat. Right, and then a little bit of ash left over. Inside of you, what's ex what are you exhaling every time you exhale? <sighs> CO2, <sighs> water vapor, <sighs> and heat. Feel it, just breathe on your hand. <sighs> Feel that heat? That's the heat of the sun. You are an expression of sunlight energy. You're just a big bag of wet rocks. And you're not even a human, and it's almost over. Think about that. I mean, that's really, the, that's the truth. And most people never consider this at all. Most people don't even know why they eat. They just get hungry. And what you're doing is you're, you're, you're decomposing food inside. Look, there's a hole at this end of your body and there's a hole down here, okay? And there's a tube going through your body. And that's the outside world that's inside of you. And it's separate from the inside of your body. And that it's just got all these bacteria and fungi in there. And what you're doing is you're feeding them. And when you feed the bugs in your gut, they, their numbers explode. And then blah, 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 it goes to some other part of your gut where it's not so favorable for them to live. And they start to die. And some other bugs are waiting there to eat those bugs. And then their populations explode. Blah, 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 goes to the next part of your gut where it's a different chemical environment where the other bugs start to die and some other bugs live and they eat those bugs. And every time they do that, they ooze out a little enzyme which dissolves the organic matter at low temperature, not at high temperature. And a little bit of the nutrient gets loose. They suck up some of it, but some of it goes through the elementary wall of your, of your elementary canal and into your bloodstream. And that's why you live. That's why you're alive. Every one of us, you can just feel your heart beating right now. We just feel that. 
That is the energy of the sun that was captured from plants through photosynthesis of plants that lived in soil. And without that, there's nothing. And actually, there is nothing else. That's the only thing that's really happening on this planet. 93 million miles away, there's a planet, a, a, a star giving UV radiation to this planet. Plants have figured out a way to capture that energy, to capture energy from the sun and put it into carbon to carbon bonds and rocks dissolve in water and the plants take that up. And through all of that, you have this, we live. And everything else is a sideshow, okay? Everything is derivative of that. And the more you can internalize and understand that basic fact, those are facts, then you can understand where you belong and you do belong in the system. You're part of it. And as you have been billions of times already, every atom in your body has been through the soil system billions and billions of times and won't be long now and you'll be back into the soil system. And I would even argue that you are soil at this moment. You're a four dimensional complex habitat, a self-organized natural body, a living thing made from the same things that this soil is made from, made from the same thing that, that these rocks are made from. I mean, you are an earthling and this is what you're made out of. And this is what everything is made of. So when we go to Cliff Hall's land, and we walk around, what we're seeing is that whole process just laid out there in the just the most amazing, beautiful thing you can ever imagine. And here we are at this time. We're here now in this point in the evolution of this planet and this whole system. And we get to look at it and think about it and experience it and taste it and smell it. And I, I challenge you tonight. Before your head hits the pillow, go outside in a private moment alone and get down on your hands and knees and pull up a little soil and just take a pinch of it and just go, one billion, I belong. And just do that. I dare you. I double dog dare you to do it. I do. And then just take a sniff of it. Oh my God. It smells like, it smells like the forest. It smells like the ocean, it smells like the river, it smells like the woods. It's amazing. And did you know that there are antidepressant compounds released from soil microbes that are identical to the antidepressant compounds that are marketed? I, I don't even remember what it smelled, what, what I felt like two seconds ago. I mean, my life has changed just because I smell soil every day, every day. All I ask you to do one second a day for the rest of your life to just think about soil. Just that's all. If we all did that, it'd be a different place. It would be a different place because we'd under, we'd just be reminded, oh yeah, that's right. I am soil and I am returning. And this is a glorious moment and nothing else really matters. And I belong. I mean that, right. And then just talk and then just huff a little bit of it. I mean, it's like good for you and, and pass it on. You know, the rules. Take a little pass it on, brother, right? I mean, this is, this is the real stuff. Hey, do you wanna know what the answer is? Doesn't matter what the question is. Do you wanna know what the answer is? The answer is add organic matter. Add organic matter. When you add organic matter, three times a day if you're lucky, when you add organic matter, what you're doing is you're adding carbon and energy, carbon from the atmosphere and energy from the sun. And that's what makes soil soil. It's not just rocks that are ground up into different sizes. It's not just dissolved rocks. It's rocks that have energy and carbon. What soil is, is a giant battery that's storing energy in the form of carbon to carbon bonds in organic matter. And that is the energy underground. I mean, the bugs that live in this soil, they don't even know there's a sun. They're in the dark. They're always in the dark down in there. And what are they doing? They're just waiting for stuff to die and then they can eat it and then they can get the energy from it. And that's the same for you. You can't photosynthesize. 
You can't sit out in the sun and get energy from the sun and carbon from the atmosphere. You have to like eat stuff that can do that. And it's all about plants. It's all about plants. And if you want to feed the soil, which is really what you're doing, if you're a gardener, you're not really gardening. All you're really doing is you're ranching microbes and you're feeding the soil. And then the, the rest of it comes along for the ride. And so what are you feeding it? Add organic matter. Because what is it? Carbon, energy, and nutrients, right? In the form of carbon to carbon bonds. And the bugs in the soil, the billions in a single pinch, they will ooze out enzymes that will dissolve the organic matter and burn it at low temperatures. Why does a compost pile get hot? Energy of the sun being released from the carbon to carbon bonds, being broken in the CO2. Why does a, car, why does a compost pile get smaller? Because it's going back to CO2, water vapor and heat. You can see the water vapor coming off as steam. You can feel the heat of a compost pile. And what's happening is the compost pile is getting smaller, but the mineral nutrients are becoming more concentrated. And so it becomes a very highly concentrated, lower carbon, but more of the mineral nutrients in it. So it's a, it's a, type, it's a type of very low um, uh, amount of, of fertility, but adding organic matter, that's what it is. And every time you eat, you are by digesting it and the energy and the carbon are being released. And the ash is what your skeleton is made out of and your teeth. That's the ash you're made. I mean, when you, if you, when you die, you could be cremated. And what's left over? The mineral nutrients that were in you, right? That's what's left over. The rest of it goes back to CO2, water, vapor, and heat, right? What comes out of the tailpipe of your car? CO2, water, vapor, and heat. Because what do you think gasoline is? It's old photosynthate from ancient plants that either in the ocean or on the land that were died and accumulated in the Carboniferous period and then got compressed under high heat and high temperature and turned into oil. All it is is carbon to carbon bonds. And when you get that to 451 degrees, what happens? It ignites and it releases CO2, water, vapor, and heat. And the heat expands the gas, which pushes the piston down, which makes the crank go around. It's why you drive. And what comes out of the tailpipe of your car? CO2, water, vapor, and heat. It's all energy from the sun. I mean, wow. Blows my mind. I mean, every day I get to, I get to teach this every day. And I, I just live for it. So I'm trying to get to my slides now. <laughs> James? Yeah, question. You know, now that we all, um, we know that we're, we are uh, bags of wet rocks and we're thinking about going out and um, putting our hands in our soil where we are. I'm gonna launch the first poll. Yeah, do that, great idea. What is so the poll is, do you know what your soil type is where ah. you live? What are you gonna be digging into tonight? So if everybody wants to throw yeah. an answer up into great. the poll, we'll let the- Well, two people are like, yeah. Let the poll run for a little Three bit people, and then we'll look people. at the results. Of course. What is the soil type? Very good. Wow, this is exciting. This is just what we needed here. Give it just a few more seconds for anybody else who wants to yeah, put come a, on, everybody. Let's put a vote see. in let's, there. Let's get, man, okay, we got some serious soil dorks here, man. 15 people already know their soil. They're probably farmers, I'm guessing. I'm sure, you have farmers. That okay, are, I'm going to end it there. Soil. And so, yeah. yeah. 81%. Okay. No, I, I so what the never. Soil is that they're going to be breathing and huffing tonight. That's right. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And you know, I, what I want to do before we get finished here today, I mean, there's a, a I didn't really get to my slides here yet, but, but I, I do want to uh, share with you that you can uh, buy this soil t-shirt. I'm not, I normally don't, uh, you know, um, sell product, but <laughs> just telling you right now, I have these uh, soil t-shirts that by, uh, if you go to soilforward.org, I have ladies and uh, gender neutral and a hundred percent of the sale of these t-shirts goes to fund my student interns. So just saying, just throwing it out there, okay? And I also have them um, in, um, in Klingon and in Vulcan as well. So if you know any trekkers, there you go. So anyway, 
so yeah um hey my name is james cassidy i am an oregon state oregon state university soil science faculty advisor and founder of the osu retirement program i'm also a former president of the oregon society of soil scientists i've done that three times anyway it's all about soil right and i you know there are different kinds of soil so look at this there's 12 i don't know if you know this but there's 12 different soil orders so we categorize soils, since that question was asked, this is perfect timing. We categorize soils based on their differences. That, and you, believe it or not, there are many different kinds of, in fact, there's 20,000 different named soils. Just like plants and animals have names and the, the whole Linnaean system of, of categorization, taxonomy, we have soil taxonomy too. And here, and so the major kind of high level, there's 12 major soil orders. And here's just a couple of them. And look at, here's one called an aridosol. And what do you think aridosol means, right? It means dry, right? And does, do rocks dissolve in air? No, they dissolve in water. So in an arid environment, you, very little nutrients are released right? And the water doesn't go very deep. Look, in fact, this is like one foot thick here, this soil, very, very shallow soil. And it rains in the desert a little bit. And in this environment, I can tell you it rains about six inches because if this is 50% porosity, and we put six inches of water on top, it's going to go down about 12 inches because half of the space is occupied by particles. And so what's the first thing that dissolves out of a rock? Salts. And so the water dissolves the salts and they move down to about here and it stops raining. And then it dries up and that happens over and over and over. And pretty soon you got a layer of salt here. So the salts never get to the ocean here because it doesn't rain enough. And so now you've got a soil that doesn't have very many nutrients released and it has quite a bit of salt. And that's what an aridosol is. And in order to live there, you got to look like this, you know? I mean, that's it. That's what you look like if you live in an aridosol. And even in this soil, even in this soil that we're talking about being really salty and not very nutrient rich and not a lot of organic matter, right? Because this stuff grows really slow. And so it's not a lot of organic matter. Even in this soil, there are billions in a single pinch of organisms. And there are these biofilms that live in crusts that are very, very fragile and very unique organisms. And they can live in that high heat, high salt, low nutrient, low organic matter environment. And over here on the right, this is called a mollusol. And a mollusol is like the, is the king or queen or whatever, the top of, the, of, of agricultural soils. And if any farmers are out there right now, I mean, you know what this is. You can look at that and you say, oh yeah. You know, this is like, like a soil porn or something. Here's like, beautiful. look at this dark black, this is organic matter in here. And where did the organic matter come from? Roots. So roots are made of carbon. They go into the ground and they inject into the ground and then they die and they rot away and they leave behind a little bit of organic matter residues. And they do that over and over and over for tens of thousands of years. And pretty soon you got this thick chocolate cake of a soil that has a lot of energy and a lot of nutrients in it. Right, And this is like in feet, it's like two feet thick of what we would call topsoil. We call that an A horizon in the soil nomenclature. But mall, to mollify something is to soften it. Your molars, they soften. And so this is a soft, cakey soil. And that's why they call it a mall. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'll tell you that, you know, here's, you know, here's a mall. So here's the amazing thing. Here's an inceptosol right? Look at this has got some dark stuff in it, but mostly it's rocks. If you actually wanted to farm in this, you'd have to take all the rocks out. And if you took all the rocks out, what would be left? Not very much soil. So look at this though. 12% of the earth's ice-free surface are aridosols. 17% of the earth's ice-free surface are inceptosols. I mean, that's like 30% of the earth's ice-free surface. And there's probably another 20% that's well, maybe less than that, is ice. And so there's not a huge amount of soil around that can be used for farming. And if you look at this, there's a map of the, of the global soil regions. 
Look, here's a mollusol. I was in the green here. Look, all you need to know about why we are sitting here at 6.49, hanging out and chit-chatting on Zoom right now, just for the fun of it, is because we have more mollusols in this country than any other country except one in the, United, in the world. 21% of our land mass, because of where we are here at latitudes, we're at the medium latitudes, 21% of our land mass is mollusols. Worldwide, 7%. That's the difference. That's why we're a rich nation. Because the, if you've got the good soil, you can grow the good food. And if you can grow the good food, you can fuel the industrial revolution and specialization. And anybody can become anything they want in this country because somebody else is growing the food. And that's the ultimate expression of what the invention of agriculture is. It allows some people to become specialists at growing the food so that everybody else can become specialists at something else. And that includes doctors and brain surgeons and car mechanics and, and all the things, teachers and, and lawyers even. You could blame it on the soil, you know? And there's one other nation on the planet Earth that has as much mollusks as we do, that's Mother Russia. And talk about ultimate experience the ultimate expression of specialization is thermonuclear engineers who can make thermonuclear weapons. And they who have the, what you're, what they who have the mollusols control the planet for good or for evil. I mean, that's just a fact. And, and that's what the Cold War was all about and still is, the hot wars and the Cold Wars. Look at the places on the planet where the aridosols are. They're all around here, the troubled regions of our planet are where there are limited resources, right? So what you're really looking at here, yes, it's a soil map of the earth, but it's actually a map of geopolitical power. And the power literally comes from the sun in the form of organic matter, which can be exchanged and has value. And that's what the dollar bills in your pocket are based on. You might think it's the gold standard, whatever. What it's based on is the sunlight energy and the value of crops that you can grow from it and exchange that or trade with, okay? Just throw that out there. Just put that in your pipe and smoke it. Here's an oxisol. This is what we have in the tropics. In the tropics, it's mostly, it's really wet and really hot. So all of the nutrients get washed out and end up in the ocean and become sharks. You might be thinking, oh yeah, but what about the jungles? No, the jungle and the wet and all this, these rainforests, most of the, of the nutrients are being cycled in the above ground biomass. That's why the tropics look like they do. Because if it gets into the soil, there's no storage of nutrients in the soils there because they're mostly iron oxide. The last thing left after rocks dissolve away, the most stable element, the most stable compound on the planet Earth are iron oxides. And that's why the soils in the tropics look like that. If you've ever been to the tropics, they're red. It's mostly iron oxide. That's why Mars is red. It's because it used to be a lot of water there. And now there isn't. And you got to wonder, did it look like this at one time? Maybe, right? I mean, there are giant rivers 10 times the size of the Amazon that are dry on Mars that clearly had rivers. And so that's why the, go up there and look at it tonight or when you get a chance. And just think about that is red because of iron oxide because rocks dissolve in water. And oh my God, it's all one. We are one, right? We are part of this whole cosmic thing. And you know, here's, here's we in, the, in Oregon, Ten, we have 10 of the 12 soil orders in Oregon. We don't have oxisols, which is what, and we don't have gelosols. And gelosols are the frozen soils that we see up here in these very high latitudes. So we actually have found oxisols in the Oregon, the Oregon Society of Soil Scientists, which I highly recommend you get involved with. If you're at all interested in soil, and I'll tell you, soils people are super fun and interesting. 
because nobody wakes up at in junior high and says, I want to be a soil scientist. They say, I want to do this other thing. And at some point they realize, oh my God, it's all about soil. And then they come back to study soils. So soil scientists and people who study soils are like from all, all walks of life and are very interesting people. And this Oregon Society of Soil Scientists, we have these terrific summer tours and great winter meetings and are super fun. And so we actually went and found an oxisol. And down here, I um, can't remember exactly where it was. It was in the, um, near Grants Pass, we found one. Anyway, but there are no gelosols, although we might think there's one on, top, on Mount Hood on the uh, north face that might still actually be an actual gelosol. So, but no other state in the union has this many soil orders. So it's a super interesting place to live for that reason. And that's because look, it's really dry out here. These are volcanic mountains. This is uplifted marine sediments. Here's a valley that was flooded by the largest floods ever to have known happen on the planet Earth, the Missoula floods. I mean, that, that right there, I mean, those are just hugely, and these are, there's a billion year old rocks out in the Wallawas. And there's current volcanism in, you know, in the, in, in, in the Cascades and there's continual uplift. You know, so there's young and really old rocks here. These are spotosols that are on the coast. So here is a pile of sand from when the last ice age was. The, the ocean was 60 miles further out, 600 miles in some places. Um, and so there were the giant, you know, the dunes on the Oregon coast. Well, that used to be really extensive, all these dunes. And what are those? You know what sand is now, right? It's quartz, right? So if you want to, if you want to see ancient mountain ranges that no longer exist on this planet because they've come and completely dissolved away, just go to the ocean, put your hand in the water, taste the salts, and lift up the skeletons of the quartz from those ancient mountain ranges. And that's what that is. And these sand, this, these, this, this, this quartz sand piles up in giant dunes. And then we have a wet enough environment and coniferous trees can live here. And so when you have a, a sandy parent material with a wet, cool climate and a coniferous forest cover, you end up with these special soils called spodosols. And they're super beautiful. Look how red they are. That's the iron. And here's a zone of depletion. And here's all the organic matter. And there's reasons why it looks the way it does. And I wish I could tell you all of it, but we, we can't do, we've only got a little more time. So I'm going to keep going. There's andosols. Here's an entosol. Here's an inceptosol. Look, here's soil. Soil doesn't come in a bag. Soil forms over time from uplifted rocks, volcanism, deposited sediments. That's the parent material. And then the rain falls and they start to dissolve and some lichens might grow on them for a little bit, eating the rock directly. That's what lichens are doing. You go to a cemetery and look at the tombstones and they're completely covered with lichens because what lichens are, are a combination of fungi and um, nitrogen fixing bacteria. And they live in this colony called a lichen. And the fungi literally drills into the rock and dissolves the rock with powerful chemistry and actually extracts nutrients right from the rock. And then it gives that to the cyanobacteria and the cyanobacteria or the, um, sorry, the uh, uh, cyanobacteria can take energy from the sun, nitrogen from the atmosphere and carbon from the atmosphere. And it gives it to the, to the fungi and they have this deal worked out. And pretty soon they eat the rock and it falls apart into sand and silt and clay. And pretty soon there's enough nutrient around from all the dead, from all the dead lichens that there's an accumulation of organic matter there so that a seed can fall in there from a plant. And there's enough nutrient being stored there that it can live there. And then it can punch holes down into this. And that's what's happened here. Look right here. There's a crack here. That's not a crack. That was an old root that colonized, it pushed in as a tiny thing and got bigger. And then it died and it left behind a little organic matter residue. That's why it's a little darker there. And then another root recolonized that. And that happened over and over and over and over. And pretty soon there's a big pore here that's filled with organic matter and carbon. And now there's a unique habitat there, right? Soil doesn't come in a bag, it forms over time. Bottom line, 
Soil is habitat. We get nothing else out of this talk. If you can internalize the reality that most of the life on this planet is living below ground, not above ground. And the below ground diversity is what begets the above ground diversity. And most of the life on this planet are microorganisms that are smaller than we can see with the naked eye, so we never think about them. And yet, that is what is going on on this planet. And these plants, what they're doing is capturing energy from the sun and carbon from the atmosphere and pumping it down into where the bugs live, in the roots. And then they die and they biodegrade those and CO2, water vapor, heat, and ash are left behind. And that's just constantly happening. That's the cycle. That's what soil building is. That's why we are here tonight is because over all this time on this planet, enough nutrients have been released from the rocks, enough carbon and energy have been captured and stored so that larger complex life forms like us could actually live here. For the first billion years on the planet, it was just like almost nothing. It was just a little bit of some scums, you know, at the edges of the sea. And it wasn't until 500 million years ago when we had the first, like, real explosion of different kinds of, of critters. And eventually plants came along and roots came along with the angiosperm and gymnosperm revolution that happened that actually pumped oxygen into the atmosphere. On the early Earth, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. Life began in an anaerobic environment. And those bugs that live from anaerobic times, they still exist in some form deep in the soil, down in the rocks. And we had, that was a catastrophe for them when oxygen came into the atmosphere. It was like global oxygen crisis. And they just went deeper into the rocks. And then we all have benefited from that. So anyway, so um, what I do want to show you though, um, I think it would be really cool if we actually looked at Cliff's land a little bit in, in the context of this conversation that we've been having. Or maybe you want to throw another poll out there, Matt. What do you think of that? Sure. I have another poll question, and this kind of relates to um, human civilization and all of our uh, whatever. <laughs> all of our whatevers. I'm trying to find the second poll. One yeah. Moment. While you're doing that, just look at this little image. This is a cluster of soil that's a, a, about a half a millimeter by a millimeter. Okay, what does it say? How far back in your family would you have to go to find your ancestors farming? This would be very interesting. Whoa, well, sounds like looks like Oregon there right off the bat. I have no earthly idea. <laughs> that yours, Matt. <laughs> it's nice. So yeah, look at that. I mean, a couple of generations for, for 29, 30% of people. Okay, I'm gonna end the polling. Yeah. So you have one more time and then I'll, I'll share it yeah. a, little, a little more uh, correctly this time. So yeah, share the results so everyone can see them. Very interesting. So it's, either, it's kind of bimodal, I think is what we call that, is like you're either farming now or it's like a couple generations ago or something like that. Yeah. And then everybody else is sort of somewhere else. And then look at the, and there's some that are over a hundred. So really it's mostly city slickers and a few farmers <laughs> and then some other folks who are pretty close. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, really, if you think about it, it's like, you know, at most, especially if you're from, you know, if you were, uh, if your family has been in the United States for more than three generations, everybody was a farmer almost back in the day. And, you know, people knew a lot more about soil. I bet people thought more about soil 100 years ago than they do now. We've been sort of isolated from it, or at least out of, out of the success of agriculture, we've actually lost our sense of understanding the, the value of soil, which is actually, I think, the problem. It's a crisis. You know what it feels like to be in the middle of the greatest extinction event ever to have known happen on the planet Earth? Like this? James, I have a question. Um, yeah. You know, that's an interesting point that people, uh, you know, who aren't soil scientists probably are a lot less engaged or knowledgeable about soil. But 
in the in the realm of soil science in the last 100 years, what's the what's the biggest revelation? What's the biggest um, change in thinking or biggest discovery? I guess in soil science. In soil science and what scientists have learned about soil. Yeah, I mean, I think I I mean the way science has progressed generally since you know 150 years ago, a couple hundred years ago at most, is physics was first. Uh, the understanding of soil physics was kind of a breakthrough. The ability to actually think about the way the water moves, the way the water is stored, the size of the particles, that was sort of a revolution that allowed us to like think about agriculture in a slightly more um, data-driven way. Like we could add a certain amount of water to get the amount of water we could. And then from that, chemistry is beget from from, from physics. And I think the 20th century was famously uh, the, the century of chemistry. And the idea that we could uh, synthesize nutrients and that we could control all of that um, to the, for the betterment of the world and for great profits and for whatever else and control of the planet and so that was a revolution to be able to, for the Harbor Bosch method to, to have nitrogen. You know, that was a big revolution in soil science, which, you know, has, has kind of hit the wall. I mean, we're kind of, it's, it's all about fossil fuels. And now we're starting to understand the relationship of the atmosphere with the soil and the carbon and all that stuff. But I think we're right on the cusp of the great revolution in soil science, which is biology which is this biochemistry, right? And, and that's where the answers are for these big problems and the understanding of the carbon cycle because a, a soil is a living thing. 50 years ago, you just couldn't study uh, bacteria and fungi the way you can now. And just the fact that we can, co you know, like from PCR and the way we can look at DNA analysis, we can take this soil and we can throw it in a blender, whiz it up, throw some chemicals at it, blow up the DNA of all these bugs that are in here, and then and analyze for specific groups of functional groups in the DNA, we can actually put together maps of the, of the relationships between all these organisms. We can't really identify them specifically because they're super hard to study, but we can see the, these, these assemblages. And I think that is really, it's a race whether we can get there in time to actually do what we need to do in this planet. And so I think, you know, uh, obviously global climate change is sort of taking up a lot of space as it should from a carbon sequestration in soils and that sort of thing. And regenerative agriculture is part of that. It's all very exciting right now, but really it's the nitty gritty of the biology. I mean, the, the, if anybody who's listening to this right now, I bet everybody who's listening to this right now has taken an antibiotic at some point in their life. And for all they know, it saved their lives, right? And where most antibiotics come from, they aren't invented, they're discovered in the soil because that's where the bacteria are. So there are certain bacteria that produce compounds that repel or kill other bacteria. And that's a way of holding territory. So if you can figure out what kind of bacteria you want to get rid of and you go to the soil and you find those and you find the antagonists of those, you can manufacture that. And that's what an ant, I mean, um, streptomyces. If you've ever had strep throat and you take, I mean, that has actually and probably saved people's lives and, and tetracycline and not tetracycline. Um, oh, what is it called? I can't remember all of them right now or any of them for that matter. But anyway, they're isolated from soil. And so the real, the real, uh, I understand, once we understand the biology of the soil at that scale, we can understand the human biology at a different scale. And so, I don't know, that's not really the answer, the one answer you wanted, but I think it's, it's kind of shows you that it's a continuum and we are in the, we're in the middle of the beginning of the biological revolution in science generally, but in soil science, I think it's gonna be critical. Like it's not just NPK that plants need. 
its soil needs a lot of things. There's a lot of chemicals and biochemicals that are super like that uh, adjuvants and stuff that make stimulate growth and stuff like that, that we're just beginning to sort of figure out. But again, because it's invisible, because it's so small, there are a lot of products marketed out there that may or may not actually, you know, uh, live up to their claims. So we got a ways to go. Great question. Wow. Man, this is so great. You guys are so smart. I mean, I just love speaking with groups like this because you, first of all, you care about something. You know, you're caring about the Greenbelt Land Trust and these amazing lands that are preserved in perpetuity for people to enjoy and to be inspired by. And I can't wait until next year when we get to go out there and actually dig a hole and actually huff soil together and actually pick up rocks together and taste them and think about them and feel the cold water, watch it dripping out of the roots and stuff like that. It's gonna be amazing. I can't wait, super excited. So um, I think we should look at Cliff's land. What do you think of that? Yeah, and while you're doing that, I just wanna encourage everybody, just question about anything that James has, has discussed or things you've always wondered about soil or your own garden or anything like that, throw them in the chat. We've yeah. got about 15 or 20 minutes left here and we'll have plenty of time to, to get to those questions. Well, let me show you something um, uh, pretty, I, I think that most of the, especially with that question of like, do you even know what soil you have? This might be a powerful little tool for you um, that I wanna share with you. And um, there's, this, there's this resource called the California Soil Resource Lab, write that down, California Soil Resource Lab. And what this, this is actually some grad students about 10 years ago now, maybe a little bit more. There's the NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is the old soil conservation service, which came out of the Dust Bowl. And I'd love to tell you the history of that someday. But the Natural Resource Conservation Service, um, uh, Roosevelt, after the Dust Bowl, decided that we should map all the soils on, in the country because he realized that the, that the health, the, the security, it's a national security issue is protecting the soil. I mean, they knew that in the 30s, okay? People don't think about that, but really they were very enlightened in the 30s and because of Hugh Bennett, who was the father of soil conservation, et cetera. But anyway, these, they, they mapped all the soils, but it's kind of a, a, a clunky um, website if you're not a professional. So these young students actually um, uh, made it available for Google Earth which is kind of cool. So you go to the California Soil Resource Lab and you go to Soil Web Apps and there's a bunch of these apps that you can open up. And there's sort of a, a, a Google Earth, in, it's called Soil Web that you don't have to have Google Earth. It's its own sort of Google Earth. So if you don't have Google Earth, but I got to show it to you on Google Earth because it's just so cool looking. And so you click on Soil Web Earth and you see it downloaded this little program. I don't know if you can see that in the lower left here. And if you click on that, it opens the soils. You'll see it right here on the left. It says soil web. So now there's layers of all the mapped soils in the United States. It's only in the United States because we're the only one that has an electronic version of the soil series or the soils um, of, of, of our country uh, mapped digitally. And I kind of find... Uh, the address you had sent me. Let me see if I can find that, Matt. Oh yeah, here it is, I got it. And so as you know, or may not know, uh, with Google Earth, you can um, put in an address and I'm gonna put in Cliff Hall's land and then we'll fly there. And you know, worth the price of admission right here just for this. I mean, this is revolutionary. This concept of being able to look at the globe and put in an address and realize you belong on this globe, right? What it's gonna do now is it's gonna show us the soil boundaries. And that can go to zoom out a bit. You can see there's a lot of different kinds of soils. Wait till that, and you'll notice that they, that the soils follow the water features. Here's the river, right? What's the name of the river? I'm not sure yep. I don't think we can see what you see. see. All right, thank you for interrupting me. I, I, here it is, here it is. Can you see that now? 
Yeah? Yes. Great. Yes. Okay, so not exactly worth the price of admission, but so here's Cliff's land. And you can see, so see these, it says soil web here. I installed that with that little program and I put in this address up here and went to it. And now we can see that the, the soils follow various um, uh, contours of the land. And these contours of the land are related to uplift, volcanism, erosion, where the river has been before. Like the river used to be here. You can sort of see that. You can see that there's a, a creek here or something. And so there's, remember there's 20,000 different named soils, right? And so here's some of them. If I click on this, here's, we got the, these soils right here. Um, there's Apt and McDuff and Preacher and Slick Rock. These are mountain slopes, right? And I'm gonna go back down here. Let's look at 25. So this is Bridewell. And a lot of these, so they're called soil series, are names of people or places. You might even recognize some of them. And so right here, this number 25 right here, this whole area has been mapped as being Bridewell or Bridwell gravelly loam. And if I click on it, I can actually look at the soil. Here's what it looks like from in depth, from, zero, from the surface all the way down to 152 centimeters. And we can see that it's a little darker at the surface, right? Because it has some organic matter in it. And Breadwell is the family, the taxonomic class is a loamy skeletal, which means it's a loam with some rocks in it. And a loam is approximately equal parts sand, salt, and clay. It's mixed, it means it's from mixed sources, like it could be uh, landslides and, and uh, flooding or rivers or something like that. It's super active. And what that means is the kind of clay that it has. It's a very, very sticky clay that holds a lot of nutrients. Mesic is about the temperature of the soil. Ultic, it has some ultic properties. Haplo means it meets the minimum requirement. Xeric, you might know what that means, a xeric moisture regime, right? So like we have cool, wet winters and we have uh, hot, dry summers. And look, it ends in all. And which soil order did you learn tonight that ends in all, as in mollusol? So it's a mollusol in a xeric moisture regime that meets and requires, has ultic and mesic properties, has superactive clays, it's from mixed sources, and it's a loamy soil with skeletal fragments in it, meaning rocks. And this is the fascinating part down here. Look at this. Um, this, this, these are the native, these are the plants that are associated with this soil, because think about it. The soil holds water a certain amount since the last rain. It heats up. It's a certain thickness. It has a certain amount of organic matter. It has a certain kind of clay in it. And so these plants are associated with that soil. And wherever you can map that soil, you're likely to find these plants. So if you're interested in re rehabil rehabilitation of, of landscapes, the first thing you want to do is find out what the soil is to see what kind of soil it is. And look, the parent material is gravelly alluvium. And what that means is it was from a flood or a river and it's kind of gravel, right? It's well-drained and that's because it's got large pores in it, right? So it drains because it's gravelly and it's sandy, right? In fact, look down here. Here's the organic matter at depth. At the surface, it's about 5% organic matter, which is actually pretty good. That's what makes it a, a, a mollusol. You might think that doesn't sound like a lot, but between four and 5% organic matter is enough for it to be a pretty darn good soil and have a lot of carbon, energy, and nutrients, and biology in it. But it only goes down to about maybe 10, 20 centimeters, and then that drops off to almost nothing at depth. Look at the percent clay, about 20% clay, which bumps up right around, you know, maybe 10, 20 centimeters. And look at the sand, it goes from 35%, then it drops. This is, these are different flood events, right? So there was a big flood here. There was another flood that had less sand in it. And then there was another flood that had sand over that. So this is probably flooded three or four times in, in the last 10,000 years or something. Here's the pH. Here's the rate at which water flows in. So if you were to put a coffee can on there and fill it with water, it would it would drain that coffee can at 32 millimeters per hour. So about an inch an hour, it could suck in water. 
right? It has a kind of a low pH, which if, if you're a farmer, you know that 5.5 is a little low, which you'd prefer is 6.5 or 6.8. So it's a little acidic. And that's what these plants like. These plants like that amount of organic matter. They like this amount of clay and they like this amount of sand and they like this sort of infiltration and this pH. And that's why they're there. And that's what a native plant is. It's a plant that is adapted to the soil conditions. And the soil conditions, of course, are related to the climate conditions, right? So they're all, it's all one, man. It's all one. And look at, look at the salts. Here's a salt. Here's a salt. Here's a, look at the salts. Where, why are there no salts here? Where are the salts? Where do the salts end up? In the creek, in the river, into the ocean. If this was a desert soil, we'd see a bunch of salt right here at a certain depth. The CEC is the amount of nutrients that can be stored. And 25 is really good. And what that is is 25 six, times 6 trillion trillion negative charges per, um, per cubic, what is it? per cubic centimeter or something. I can't remember right now because I'm drawing a blank, but we didn't go into that. I would love to tell you more about that. And this is the shrink swell capacity, but check it out. And so that's for 20,000 different soils. Here's Cliff's land, right? We usually come in at the, at the, uh, the, the parking lot here. We walk along this creek and we look at this, all these different soils. And this soil in here is, um, is the Abaqual silty clay loam. And if we look at that, you'll notice that it has a lot more clay, it starts at 32% and not very much sand. And look at the organic matter is pretty good and the pH is a little higher. And that's because there's a creek there and there's a lot of vegetation there. And so the creek is just, is washing, is not so fast that it washes away the clay. And so the clays can accumulate. And here over in this little part over here, this is the McAlpine, which I, did we already look at that? I'm not sure, I don't think so. Anyway, so you can learn about your own soil. So if somebody is willing to put in, tell me what their address is, I promise I won't send you a pizza or shit, I'll send you a pizza. How about that? Um, who's got an address that you can put in? Who would be willing to share their private information? Anybody? How about you, Matt? Here we go. No, we've got one from Larry and Rebecca. Okay. 5570. 5570. Southwest 3rd Street. Southwest 3rd Street. In Corvallis. Corvallis. There it is. Triple three. So there we go. So we're going to fly over there. Okay. There it is. Way down there. Wow. This, now look at this soil. Look at the color of that soil. So we know this, I'm predicting this is a wood burn because I'm a soil dork. And bam, look at that, wood burn. Wood burn is a mollusol. See how it ends in all? It's an RG0. RG meaning argillic means a lot of clay. So this is a, a, a clayier soil. And it's aqualtic, meaning it has a lot of water. It's pretty wet. Probably has a pretty shallow water table, I'm guessing. There's also a 2% chance in this region that there is some Dayton, which is an alpha salt, which is even more, more poorly drained and more clay. And you can see the colors are different. See, the, the more aerated it is, the more red it is because you get more iron oxides. Where the more, le or rather the less drained it is, you see these more muted colors because of the oxidation state of iron when it's in an anaerobic environment is actually kind of grayish. So let's look at wood burn. So wood burn um, is a fine, silty, mixed, superactive, mesic aqualtic RG0. All everyone together, ready? Fine, silty, mixed, superactive, mesic aqualtic RG0. And we can see it has a dark, a, 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 an A horizon that goes down to 43 centimeters. I mean, that's, that's the real A horizon that you can grow a lot of stuff in. And that's why it looks the way it does is because this is being farmed, right? And look at this one over here. This is uh, Chehalis and Newberg. This is a sandier soil. So this is, this is a really nice soil uh, for especially like vegetable row crops. And this soil is particularly good 
for grass and orchards and hazelnuts because it holds a lot of water and you don't have to irrigate it necessarily. But you can sort of see, look at the difference. You can see the soil type is different here. Look how the growth pattern is different, right? And that's because it's a different soil type. Here we have the Dayton, which is the more wet. And I would predict that this is a little lower in elevation and probably in the middle of the winter, this is wet. Like you can actually see surface water. And look at, this is a high fertility area and this is that wood burn. So that's kind of cool, right? So you can see, you should all just, you should all at least learn what soil, and if you just fool around with this thing, you're gonna learn without even, I mean, the, the best learning is when you don't feel it, like you just happen to accidentally learn, right? Here's more Dayton and Woodburn. So let's um, let's fly. Look at here's a, here's somebody's growing some crops over here, and we can see what kind of soil they're growing on, and that is a Dayton Woodburn as well. So that's pretty typical in the Willamette Valley on the valley floor because this was all flooded at one time. This whole Willamette Valley was an inland sea for about a week or two. Now, if we go up, say, um, somewhere up into the mountains up here, and we look at what kind of soils are there. Now, these are soils that are really high elevation. They're not going to be wet, even though it rains a lot. Here's some, uh, some logging parcel. Up here, we're going to see, look at the red soils. So this is like our jory soil. We have a state soil called jory. I wonder if there's any here. Anyway, but you can see they're quite red. And these are ancient soils from uplifted basalts, from uplifted from, <coughs> from ancient basalts that used, this whole area used to be under the ocean, and then it all got lifted up. And in fact, I do want to show you one more thing before we leave. Um, this, uh, I'm going to show you some of, the, some of the things we have in this lab. Here are some soils that we have mounted here like actual specimens. And these are all Oregon soils. And it basically, they're kind of backwards in that the, the West Coast is on the right side of the room. And so here we've got black lock. This is a, a, a spotosol here, right? You can see that red with that, that depleted zone and this dark A horizon here. I think I can zoom in on that. So let's look at this soil. And you can see the surface soil is pretty dark because of the organic matter accumulation. And then if we if we go to the go east here, look at here's Astoria, right? Here's Clatsop and Stewart, and these are kind of like like the coast range. And we get all the way here, and this is called Jory right over here. And let me see if I can get this. Jory, you may not know this, but Jory is our state soil. That's right. We have a state soil. Um, and so everyone, hand over heart, there's our state soil. And it's a red soil. It almost looks like a tropical soil, which is one of the reasons it's our state soil, because it's a really ancient, uplifted basalt uh, parent material. And then as we go further to the east, we get into the Willamette Valley soils, right? You might recognize some of these names, like Nahelum and Adupi and Woodburn and uh, Santiam and Amity. And these are all locations, but they're actually the names of soils. And then we get over, we keep going over to the east. And when we get to far Eastern Oregon, right? So we get to far Eastern Oregon. And I want you to look at this one, especially this one called Tub right here. And I'm gonna zoom in on that. And if we zoom in on Tub, you can see, hang on. What's with that? Oh, no, it's not going to work. Um, um, dang, I think I've lost control here of this thing. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, you can see, look at, here's the salts. Remember I talked about that, the iridosols? So the water, it rains enough that the salts go down to about here and then it stops raining. And then they precipitate out. And pretty soon there's a huge layer of salt here. So we just went on a quick transect tour of, the, uh, of Oregon soils there. And I encourage you to, to get, go online, go to the California Soil Resource Laboratory and download that little program and look up and see what your soil is and then go dig a hole. 
Doesn't matter what the soil on the screen says, you gotta dig a hole and you gotta compare what you see with what it's mapped as. And is that correct or not? Maybe, I mean, they didn't like, they didn't sample every cubic centimeter of soil on, uh, in the United States, although they have mapped hundreds of millions of acres, if you can think about that. So. Th thanks, James. We have just a few questions and I'd love, uh, even though we're running out of time, but um, yep. I think people are interested if you could give some quick answers um, and I'm just gonna go to the top. Um, I'll just make this a two-part question. Can letting my backyard garden lie fallow for a year help it? And how important is it to rotate crops in a backyard garden? Hmm. Well, um, the importance of rotating crops is really important if it's a pretty extensive project and you're gonna be growing up the certain, some, some, some crops are more susceptible to diseases than others like uh, um, brassicas, you know, your cauliflowers, your broccolis, and your tomatoes, you kind of want to make sure those things are, are moving around. And you can make a complex map and just make sure, you know, but lettuce and stuff like that, probably not that important, but some crops are more susceptible. Now, letting it go fallow is a good idea as long as you're not allowing weed seeds to propagate. And I mean, what is a weed? A weed is just a plant out of place, of course, but some plants are more competitive with your crops than others, and that's why we call them weeds. So you really want to make sure if you're gonna let it go fallow, maybe hand scythe it every once in a while when you start to see weed, when you start to see seeds coming up, hand scythe that and take it off and keep doing that. And that's a, that's a good strategy. Maybe make it, the one thing you really wanna do though is make sure, check your pH of your soil. Um, most people, you know, they just, we're in Oregon and it's pretty wet here. And the wetter the climate is, the, the, the more acidic the soils tend to be. And so to grow most crops, you need a pH of about 6.5, 6.8, something like that. You can get a little home kit, but you can also send in a soil sample. And I highly recommend you do that. It's not super expensive and you'll learn more about your soil. See what your soil is mapped as. Now, most garden plots, of course, are people truck in soil and stuff or or even worse, people buy a property and the, the good soil has been scraped off and sold off and a bunch of fill has been brought in. So that's why you wanna dig a hole. So you wanna see what it's mapped as and see if that soil is what it is or if it's some sort of fill or something, then you're gonna to have to do something. I don't know if that's helpful for you or not, but kind well, of- And as we know, the answer is always to add organic matter. Add organic matter. Now, I have to say, for gardeners, it's pretty easy to add a lot of organic matter. And at some point, you really can kind of stop. And it, that's actually true even for large producers. Once you, there's a soil building phase where you're trying to get the soil up to four or 5% organic matter. And once you get to that, it's about maintaining four or 5% organic matter. And when we're talking about organic matter, we're not talking about sticks and leaves and stuff like that. We're talking about the black stuff that's coating the particles of the soil that make the soil dark. So you, you wanna send in your soil sample and make sure they get percent organic matter and see what you're doing over time. It'll cost you 30, 40 bucks a year, but you'll get the pH right. You'll start building the soil organic matter up, getting to a certain point. And it's easy to over fertilize a garden because it isn't that expensive. Now, if you're trying to grow a 5,000 acres of crops, you can't afford to over fertilize. But in a little garden, I don't know, 50 bucks and you, you're over fertilizing, and it's not like a big problem, but it's pollution. Also, crops that have too much nitrogen, believe it if you will, it's possible, they're tastier to pests. And so they'll take up that nitrogen into their leaves and then you'll have more pest problems. So you just want to have enough nutrient for the crops that you want to grow. Great. Well, here's one last question. So, and this is um, a scenario where you've got some concrete that you've removed. So the question is, can the micro herd come back if soil was covered with concrete for years? Would you add organic matter or would more than that need to happen to restore life to that soil? Yeah, I mean, you know, just getting the concrete off and opening it up to the sun and to the air is gonna do it. And the thing is, soil is very, I mean, 
the soil's going to be here long after we're gone. And it was here long before we were here. And it's, it's going to be fine sooner or later. But if we want it to be in, in, our, in our lifetimes, we do have to maybe help it. So all you really do is take that concrete up and wait until it's a little bit dry. And if the, the amount of dryness is if you can pick up some and squeeze it, and if it kind of ruptures rather than smears, then it's, you, can, you can work it a little bit. If you, if you try and squeeze it and it's so hard that you can't, it's too dry. So you might need to wet it a little. And then get yourself a turning fork, you know, just a, a, a turning fork or a broad fork and just stick it in the ground, right? And put your foot on it and put it down all the way and then pop it up and pop up all these chunks about this big and just do that over the whole area and let it dry out and let it get some air, let it get some sun and maybe a little rain on it. And then go and break those up a little bit and let them get some air and sun and dry out a little more. And pretty soon you can maybe rake it a little bit and then put some cover crop seed on there and just put in some legumes and some grasses, you know, go find a, a blend of cover crops and grow something there for a year, you know, over the winter. Get it in in the fall, irrigate it up, make sure it comes up, weed it a little bit, and let that cover crop go until about now, till like the end of March. And then scythe that down and feed that back to the soil. And maybe do a summer cover crop. You know, put in some Sudan grass or something and let that grow up to here. And then cut that down and let that rot over the winter. Then the next year, it's going to be pretty good. And you've added carbon energy energy from the sun and carbon from the atmosphere in the form of roots. And those roots have penetrated down and gotten bigger and made macro pores. So the infiltration capacity is higher. So water and air are getting deeper and you're adding carbon and energy. And over time, the bugs are there. They're just waiting for you to help them. They're not going away. You know, it's not sterile. It's just, they're in hibernation. There's spores. They're just waiting. They're just waiting to sporulate, you know, and they're waiting to wake up. So yes, you can restore that. But find out what kind of soil it is first. Find out if it's backfill. That might require a little more amendment, like some compost. Put a big load of compost on there, then grow those cover crops. And it's just going to be nicer. Well, thanks, James. And thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, God. Remember to check out James's t-shirts, which help fund right. the uh, student farm operation. Um, some great resources for learning about soil. And I just want to leave you with a quote from James tonight. You are an expression of sunlight energy. That's You're just a, a big bag of wet rocks and it's almost over. And, and fact, our presentation and our evening together tonight is over. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, James and soilforward.org. And um, remember, uh, add organic matter. April. Soil is habitat. Yeah, Matt, thank you. You're like one of the best students around. Thanks, really? everybody. Thank you, James. Thanks, everybody. Good Go out there and huff some soil. <laughs>